Thank you for joining me today. My name is Gus Silke. I'm the Director of Faith Formation at St. Babel Church. And uh, this is a, the first in a series of podcasts for the uh, Religious Education Program uh, at uh, St. Babel. And the theme that I want to look at today is entitled, The Goal of Our Teaching. You see, the goal of our teaching, according to St. Paul, is love, okay? Uh, and that, that's what I really want to focus on. And I want to uh, highlight this passage from the Catechism. Uh, this is from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 25. The whole concern of doctrine and its teaching must be directed to the love that never ends. Whether something is proposed for belief, for hope, or for action, the love of our Lord must always be made accessible so that anyone can see that all the works of perfect Christian virtue spring from love and have no other objective than to arrive at love. Now, the problem is that we overuse and misuse the word love. I mean, in our society, there's a lot of confusion about what love really means. And indeed, that's one of the reasons we need to step back and reflect on this as the core of our vocation as parents and religion teachers or catechists. Remember the word catechist. What does that mean? It comes from the Greek. It means to echo. The catechist, their job is to echo God's word in the community. It's not to make up things. It's not to tell nice stories simply. Although stories can be very helpful. And in fact, you know, you can look at the New Testament and see how Jesus used parables and stories to get points across. But the most important thing a catechist does is be a faithful echo chamber for God's word, for the logos. And that, uh, that's preeminent in the work of a catechist. There's also some other insights about love and catechesis. My favorite one came from a youth minister I worked with. And he used to say, Gus, what we need to do in order to teach people doctrine is first help them fall in love with Jesus. Because once they fall in love with Jesus, they'll be able to follow Jesus into the, the deeper points of doctrine. And I think he was exactly right that there's that intimate relationship between the content of faith and the movement of love. They, they, they go right together, really. Actually, in the Christian experience, faith, hope, and love really do operate together in the soul. But the greatest is love. So that, that's the goal of our teaching is to, is to manifest that love. Now, uh, the, one of the prayers of the church that's special to me as a married man is the preface to the mass of matrimony. It says, love is our origin, love is our destiny, and love is our most high calling. So with the calling in mind of God, who is love, let's, let's examine the journey of an atheist named Tommy.
it turns out that Tommy uh, was a student of the famous Jesuit theologian John Powell. John Powell was well known as a theologian from Loyola University uh, in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, and uh, so he taught this theology class at Loyola and his students filed in uh, for the first class. And that's when he met Tommy. And Tommy turned out to be his atheist in residence. Uh, Tommy was, uh, w was going to challenge Father Powell right down the line in terms of faith. And the other thing about Tommy, he had long flaxen hair that hung six inches below his shoulders. Now, Father Powell knew that it's what's in your head and not on it that counts, but he was unprepared for Tommy. He, he wrote Tommy off as strange, very strange. Despite the fact that Tommy was his atheist in residence, they managed to live together in relative peace. But at the end of the course, Tommy asked Father somewhat cynically, do you think I'll ever find God? Father decided on a little shock therapy. No, Tommy, he said emphatically, I don't think you'll ever find God, but I'm certain that God will find you. Tommy shrugged and left. Father Powell felt a little disappointed that Tommy had apparently missed his clever line. About a year later, Father Powell learned that Tommy had terminal cancer. Father writes, Before I could search him out, he came to me. When he walked into my office, his body was badly wasted, and his long hair had fallen out because of chemotherapy. Tommy, I've thought about you so often. I hear you're sick, I blurted out. Oh, yes, very sick. I have cancer. It's a matter of weeks. Can you talk about it? Sure. What would you like to know? What is it like to be only 24 and know that you're dying? Well, it could be worse. Like what? Well, like being 50 and having no values or ideas, Tom said. Like being 50 and thinking booze and seducing women and making money are the real biggies in life. But what I really came to see you about is something you said to me on the last day of class. I asked if you thought I would ever find God, and you said no, which surprised me. Then you said, but God will find you. I thought about that a lot, even though my search for God was hardly intense at that time. And so Father thought, my clever line, he thought about that a lot. Tommy went on to tell Father that after the doctors removed the malignant lump from his groin, he got serious about trying to locate God. I really began banging against the bronze doors of heaven but nothing happened. Well, one day I woke up and instead of throwing a few more futile appeals to a God who may or may not be there, I just quit. I decided to spend what time I had left doing something more profitable. I thought about something else you said. The essential sadness is to go through life without loving. But it would almost be equally sad to leave this world without ever telling those you loved that you love them. So I began with the hardest one, my dad. He was reading the newspaper when I approached him. Dad, I would like to talk to you. Well, talk. I mean, it's really important. The newspaper came down three slow inches. What is it? Dad, I love you. I just wanted you to know that. The newspaper fluttered to the floor 
Then my father did two things I couldn't remember him doing before. He cried and hugged me, and we talked all night, even though he had to go to work the next morning. It was easier with my mother and little brother. They cried with me, too. And we hugged one another, and we shared the things that we'd been keeping secret for so many years. I was only sorry that I had waited so long. Here I was in the shadow of death, and I was just beginning to open up to all the people I actually felt close to. Tommy then shared with Father Powell what happened next. It was something he had not anticipated. Tommy said, I turned around and God was there. You were right. He found me. Tommy discovered that God had always been there waiting for him while he had been banging against the bronze doors of heaven, God had been patiently knocking at the door of Tommy's heart. And so when Tommy opened the door of his heart to love, he found God standing there. Father Powell was silent for a moment. Then, in a low voice, choked with emotion, he said, Tommy... I think you're saying something much more universal than you realize. You are saying that the surest way to find God is not to make him a private possession or an instant consolation in time of need, but rather by opening to love. You know, St. John said that God is love and whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. Tom, could I ask a favor? Would you come to my Theology of Faith course and tell my students what you told me? Though we scheduled a date, he never made it. Before he died, we talked one last time. I'm not going to make it to your class, he said. I know, Tom. Will you tell them for me? Will you tell the whole world for me? I will, Tom. I'll tell them. Th this story reveals something really, really profound about uh, the dynamics of faith and love, as you can see. What happened was, uh, uh, it was like uh, Tommy overcame his atheism uh, because he turned and opened to love of the people closest to him. And in that love, he was able to clear the decks for God to reach through to his heart. And uh, I, I find this to be absolutely uh, paradigmatic of what needs to happen when you confront the question of how to have faith, how to bridge this gap that exists with so many people in our society right now. We know about the drop off of church attendance among the, uh, uh, the millennials and the younger uh, generation yet. And yet, I, I think that, that it can be bridged if we ponder what it means to open to love. And if we also ponder the relationship between love and teaching religion. Um, the goal is love. And it, you're, we're reminded by St. Ignatius of Loyola that you should begin with the end in mind. And it also sounds like uh, the seven habits of uh, uh, effective people, uh, that book also. Begin with the end in mind. The goal is love, and, and of course, love is not a sentimental feeling or a wistful longing or an immature infatuation for people or things or pets. However, the beauty that God has created in all these things remains an invitation to us in our imperfection to go deeper, our efforts to uncover the reality of what love really is. Love, as we know from traditional definition is willing the good of another for their own sake. 
you know, real love is found in our willing the good for ourselves and others. The only way we can discover the goodness that we should will to others is to recognize the need we have to purify our hearts, form our consciences, and be guided by a faith based on God's full revelation of the church. You know, a sincere faith uh, is not just found in my subjective sincerity, as important as that is. But we need also to have a faith that's sincere in another more objective sense. Um, and sincere in this sense means without error or falsehood. To open ourselves to this kind of faith requires our willingness to follow Jesus to the heart of the church. Kind of like what that youth minister said to me. Fall in love with Jesus and let Jesus guide you to the heart of the church. As we do this, we discover that one of the greatest graces of God given to the church is this perfect gift of faith. It's, it's really remarkable. But you can see that it's always um, hidden, as it were, in the struggles of our human relationships. People can claim to love God, but if they don't love their fellow human beings, their, uh, their love for God is going to go sour, I think. And I, and I think that uh, that's what happened with Tommy. When he chose to open to love, he no longer had to see his relationship with God as banging on the bronze doors of heaven. And instead, in, in simply opening to love, starting with the most difficult relationship, the one with his dad, as he said, he, uh, he opened that door for God to quote, unquote, find him. It is. It's a remarkable thing. You know, when I began my career of religion teaching at Mishawaka, and that was my job at Queen of Peace many years ago, um, a close friend of mine gave me some very counterintuitive advice. He said to me, don't be a teacher. Huh? I thought. No, he said, don't be a teacher. Be a lover. This person understood something pretty crucial about doctrine that the church emphasizes in her catechism. Love is the whole concern of doctrine. And then as my career rolled on, I encountered some big difficulties, especially uh, with opposition and people fighting and people misunderstanding each other. And another close friend of mine gave me another very important piece of advice as I got angry over some issue in the church and, 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 and allowed this sort of callous of judgmentalness to form around my heart. He said to me, don't be a judge, be a friend. Don't be a judge, be a friend. For remember, friendship is the eternal gift. You see, that goes back to what the catechism asks us to do. The whole concern of doctrine and its teaching must be directed to the love that never ends, to the eternal love, the eternal love of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Perfect love being celebrated by the three persons in one God. A mystery that goes way beyond how we could uh, uh, imagine or explain it. Although the church gives us a guide so that we don't completely miss the way that mystery is held throughout history. But nevertheless, it's way beyond us, that kind of love. And yet, that's the invitation of love that God is giving us here at St. Bavos uh, in our religious ed program this year. I want to think 
that we want to move from the question of what is love to the question, who is love? And then answer it by saying, God is love. And from that answer, we can continue to encounter God and deepen our relationship with the Lord over time till we understand how incredibly uh, 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 he leaves us speechless. We can't even describe it. The best way I've ever described it is to call him the God of impossible love. The, the God who loves us beyond our wildest dreams. And from that, from that encounter with God, we always have the choice to love other people. We have free will. We always have the choice to love. And that's pretty amazing because um, the, the problem with us human beings, us sinners, is that we, in the words of the poet, uh, songwriter Bob Dylan, we'd like to water down love. You know, uh, he wrote that song, Watered Down Love. And... Uh, the chorus goes something like, uh, you don't want a love that's pure. You want to drown love. You want to water down love. And it, it is, it's really true that our tendency is to, is to take this great gift, that, say the gift that Tommy opened up to, uh, and sort of uh, treat it cheaply. OK, water it down, like Dylan says. Well, I want to suggest that the project of teaching religion is to once again focus us in on not watering down our love. And so uh, we will be doing things at St. Bevo's that will focus in on making the uh, experience of learning the faith to be multidimensional and thematic rather than just academic. When I say just academic, you've heard the expression about academia is where the notes from the teacher goes to the notes of the student without passing between the brain of either one. And that's an exaggeration of what happens in a lot of academic exchange, of course. But that's not religion teaching at that point. That becomes uh, just an exercise in content. And although content's really important, we're not going to minimize the content of doctrine or the proper teaching of it. We want to put it into the context of a loving community making a pilgrimage together. So we'll be doing things together and having activities together and eating together and sharing together and having fun together as well as learning the content. And I believe that that will bless the children and bless the families. It's it's really important. Um, the themes uh, that we'll cover the next uh, three months are going to be creation as a gift from God. That's the first theme that's on September. Uh, September 11th on Sunday at 4 o'clock, we'll gather and uh, we'll learn about creation, having awe before creation, pondering the gift of creation, Encountering God as the loving Father who created all. Um, and uh, the second uh, class in October will focus on baptism. And the, uh, the third class uh, will focus on, in November on Eucharist. You can see that we're going to take the themes, the very most basic themes, and expand them in a, 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 a retreat style setting rather than a academic classroom setting 
because the goal of doctrine is love. Now, as I think about the choice to love, I want to uh, uh, think about the fact that there's always going to be in our families and in our communities times when this choice to love and to be willing to love clashes with our unwillingness to love. The clash between love and the unwillingness to love is most uh, deeply imaged in the suffering of Christ on the cross. You see, uh, God is not alien to anything in the human experience except one thing, the unwillingness to give ourselves to the adventure of love. When we're unwilling to love, that creates a, a break or a separation in the relationship we call sin. And uh, sin obviously gets in the way of love. And over the year, we will be looking at how to overcome that and how to grow in faith, hope, and love. I'll, I'm going to read just a, a little uh, reflection from John Donne on this question of being capable of love. Why does being capable of love depend, therefore, on being willing to go through suffering? It's because loving means going out to the things of life, just as knowing means taking the things of life into oneself. When I make the lover's choice, when I give my heart to my life rather than withhold my heart, I enter into a relationship with the things of my life that makes me vulnerable to loss and deprivation. God becomes vulnerable in loving the world, for God so loved the world. That's why the cross becomes the sign of that. And yet, it, a, an ultimate sign of vulnerability is also an ultimate sign of victory. Hail, Holy Cross, right? Ave Crucis. Hail, Holy Cross, the source of our victory. Isn't that amazing? So, to go back to me, if I'm unwilling to go through suffering, I become unable to make the lover's choice. If I enter into God's relationship with the world, on the other hand, if I embrace suffering, that of my own life and that of others in connection with me, I become able to give my heart. I become capable of love and of the knowledge that comes of love. I become capable of God. That's what happened to Tommy. When he opened to love in his, in his most difficult relationships, he became more capable of God. Now, God was always there for him, but he couldn't become conscious of God until he made the lover's choice. And indeed, that is the heart of the struggle. How does this relate to teaching religion? There's one line from a theologian named Gus. Interestingly enough, it's not me. It's Gus uh, uh, Severit. This is in Communio magazine for uh, spring of 2022, page 194. But the guy's name is Gus, so I, 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 I've got to quote him, you know? I mean, I'm, uh, I'm not quoting him just because his name is Gus. That's a joke. But I'm not joking about this. This is what he says. Only he who loves has the power of the truth. But only he who is true lives and remains in love. Please remember me as loving you and let me know in this year how I can help make your experience of the religious ed program at St. Babel's 
a rewarding one for you, your children, and the catechists, and the wonderful working renewal group that put this program together, as well as the coordinators that are helping us. We're going to do it all together, and I need your input, your cooperation, and I appreciate your time to watching this podcast. May the Lord bless you richly, and may the Lord bless St. Babel's parish and our pilgrimage together richly. Amen.